I'm Christy and you are? Yep, I'm Bexson. And you wrote this amazing book that I have lots of people reading. Great, yes, it's uh, selling very well in the States at the moment. Is it? Yes. Well, I am so Had a huge happy. boost of sales this, this month. Well, there we go. I think it's because of my book club, I'm going to say. <laughs> it might be. Um, I first read about you in the New York Times article with Jane Brody. Yes, yeah. And so did she interview you? Um, no, she... Well, I can't remember now. That was quite a long time ago. I, I sort of get interviewed a lot, but lots of people pick up the work as well through the Stitchlings website. Yes. So I don't think I spoke to her specifically, no. I think when people look into uh, knitting as a therapeutic tool, they come across my name and then quote me. Mm -hmm. and, and Michael Stone I interviewed, and he talked about you. Did you do you remember Skype? Yes, yes, yes. Because he was doing his um, master's program, and he chose knitting. So were you sort of a mentor for him? Uh, yes, I have had a few Skype sessions with him. It's, it's great. It's absolutely great to see him doing that and choosing that as a subject. Uh huh. It's so awesome. Well, I've read the book and I have lots of questions, so I'm just going to get through them as many as I can until you're like, I have to go, lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was hoping you could start by just telling us about yourself. Like, how did you come to therapeutic knitting, and you know, how did you come to write a book? Well. Um... As, a, as, as my background, I'm a senior phys I was a senior physiotherapist until 2002, and at, the, at that time, I was working in the community, which meant going to visit people in their homes. Um, and quite often, uh, a, a doctor would ring me up and say, Mrs. Smith is having problems getting out of a chair. Please, would you go along and give her some exercises? And I'd go along to Mrs. Smith and actually find the reason why she wasn't getting out of her chair was because she had no reason to get out of her chair at all. She had nothing to look forward to in the day, no physic, no human contact. Um, and so I felt that actually my time was wasted because I knew with 100% certainty that these people wouldn't do the exercises I left them because they needed more intensive input that went back for, you know, sort of that that we did before doing the exercises because I felt we needed to take a step back with them. Um, they first needed to um, develop an interest in the world again, have human contact again, uh, social contact, supportive friends, and most of all, develop a real aspiration to improve their own well-being. Uh, so until they got that, really, there was no hope in trying to get them to self-manage. Uh, a, a, you know, a long-term medical condition, which is what most of them had. Um, and most of them, you know, their conditions were were then um, very much exacerbated by sitting, doing nothing at home alone and getting lonely. So it was a, becomes a vicious circle. Yeah. So uh, I gave up physiotherapy and um, I did uh, a year of uh, training as a PA and then I got a job um, I, I applied for work experience on uh, a big magazine uh, with a big magazine publisher uh, and I became uh, a freelance production editor for a range of magazines through them because after doing my weeks of work experience I loved it so much that I asked if they would keep me on and they said yes we'd love to have you and we do a sort of on-the-job training so I became a freelance um, production editor for a range of camera and computer magazines, um, which my children found quite amusing. <laughs> uh, um, and then I moved on to the, well, one of the editors on the craft portfolio rang me up one day and said, we'll have a vacancy for three months. Would you like to come and work with us? And one of the jobs I was assigned was looking after the letters pages of some of the magazines. And that actually did entail reading all the letters coming into the office. And they literally had sacks full of, of letters every day. Uh, and I was really struck by the high number, probably as much as 98% of people talking about therapeutic benefits of crafts, but particularly knitting. Uh, and so I was... I, I mentioned it to the editor and she said, yes, I know there's something important going on here, but I don't know what it is. And she pointed me to a cabinet 
a sort of four drawer cabinet she said that is full of letters that we've kept from a competition that we ran last year that said what you know what benefits do you get from your from your stitching and your knitting um so there were thousands of letters in there saying how people had used knitting and stitching to cope with life-changing events uh, and illness and and day-to-day -day stress so uh, I was able to read all those letters with a medical head on. Um, and my first thought was, this is something that could help Mrs. Smith from her armchair to be successful at something from her armchair as a sort of springboard back into the world again. Um, so I decided I'd research it further. So I decided to look at what science there was behind what the, what this huge number of people from a, a range of different backgrounds and cultures, um, what, if there was any science behind it. And I think the most striking thing was that there was a huge number of people from different backgrounds and different cultures saying exactly the same thing. And were you a knitter at the time? Did you knit? Um, I knit now, yes. At the time, I'm, I was one of those people who my mother taught at seven. I'd done a little bit just before my children were born, but I wasn't, I wasn't a knitter. But I am now. So were you confused, like, how is this possible, or did you get it? Did you relate? No, I, I got it, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was the fact that there were so many people saying saying the same things, that so this has to be true, I need to find out why it's so, and what the science is behind it. Um, so yes, it was more from that angle, really, I was looking at it, and, and looking at it, and it's since developed into really enhancing those benefits. So we're enhancing benefits and using knitting deliberately as a therapeutic tool, which is slightly different than just sitting down to knit. Good. That was one of my questions, actually. What is the difference between knitting and therapeutic knitting? Yeah, that, that idea has sort of evolved over the years because I first started to look, obviously, at the benefits of knitting. And then I thought, well, what if we use that learn to use it as a tool to deliberately improve your well-being. Um, so now I think, yes, there is a difference between the two. And I would say therapeutic knitting is a combination of knowledge and knitting. So knowledge about how to enhance the benefits of knitting, but also about when to use it, uh, how to use it, uh, how to use certain projects for certain mind states, and also, um, if you've got, if you're unlucky enough to have a medical condition, knowledge about that condition and how you can help it in many different ways. So therapeutic knitting, I would stress it's not just for people with health problems. It's, it can be used by anyone to manage day-to-day -day, you know, life's challenges, um, but then taken a step further to manage the symptoms of medical uh, conditions. So we're going to talk about that more um, later, but... I just had a question come to my mind, and you had this pile of letters. How did you begin developing, finding out the science? Like, how, how did you bridge the gap between a drawer full of letters and science? Well, um, my specialty was in um, physiotherapy for neurological conditions. Mm. Um, and physiotherapists have used bilateral pattern of movements for the treatment of brain injury for very many years, 40, 50 years, perhaps more. Um, so I was really immediately interested in the actual movements of knitting and how they might be contributing to to actually changing the brain in some way. Um, because I knew, you know, if, pe if people feel happier or if people feel calmer, there is a chemical change going on in that in, in your body to to make you feel those sensations. So I was really interested in how the action of knitting could cause real chemical, biological, neurological changes within a person and whether then we could use those um, to actually even treat some medical conditions. And also uh, obviously the, the social side of it mm -hmm. as well. How do you, so I've suffered, I actually suffered from viral meningitis which is like a virus of the you know the brain um, yeah. spinal cord fluids and then years later I had a grand mal seizure which no neurologist will tell me that A caused B even though grand mal seizures in persons age 16 to 60 the number one cause is 
meningitis. Yeah. <laughs> so I did not have that seizure while I was having meningitis. But I, if I were to write my book, I would say that something changed in my neural pathways when I had meningitis um, that made me susceptible to a seizure. And I noticed uh, after the meningitis that I was never quite myself again. I was never quite 100%. I always had sort of brain symptoms, I call it brain buzz, uh, in stressful situations or even environmental situations like a, like a retail store with a lot of light and a lot of noise. I was really yeah. susceptible to certain feelings and so I really feel like my neural pathways sort of shifted and changed. Yeah. And so I had uh, you know 24 hour EEGs and regular EEGs and sort of all kind of sort of testing to sort of figure out what's wrong with me. In the end, uh, I was medicated for two years for epilepsy. I never had another seizure after that. And in the meantime, I went to cognitive behavioral therapy and took up crocheting in a very intense way and just found health on my own so that yeah. when I was then taken off the medicine, I could just, I could go and sort of self-care. Yeah. So my question is, when you're testing this bilateral connection and knitting equaling happy chemicals in the brain, did you actually like measure brain activity? Did you use EEGs? What did you do? No, we haven't used any of that. We just we've just looked at the anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, people think that brain scanning gives you lots of answers, but actually, it doesn't give you a huge amount of answers. Mm -hmm. it, 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 any activity you do will show up significant activity in the brain. So it's very very difficult to to actually work out whether it's the knitting causing that or, or the way you're thinking causing that or whether it's the actual movements causing that. Um, and when, when we started to break down what was happening in knitting, the movements, the, you know, the creative side, uh, the calm side, the mastery of the skill, learning new, you know, novelty, joining a group, it's so complex that you can't measure just one element of it because it all fits together like a, a tight knit sort of jigsaw. And if if you measure if you just research one aspect of it, then you might be missing a very important bit of the picture. So um, we we sort of looked at it and we thought, well, actually, the best way of doing this at the moment is to um, to just gather people's stories and to talk to them about how it helps, uh, and then put together theories for it. Uh, and then perhaps you know further down the line, we might. We might look at the patterns of movement, but actually, you know, the cost of doing something like that is phenomenal. Um, so, and even then, you know, you can't tell what's going on, what a person is thinking, just by looking by what, the activity in the brain. Yeah. I, 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 I would say, you know, in your respect, the, ex the exciting thing and I, you know, as a physiotherapist, I knew this fact, but what it's really come home to me during this work is that uh, um, the, the benefits of neuroplasticity, everybody has the power to change themselves neurologically, biologically, socially, behaviorally, and therapeutic knitting can be used as a tool to facilitate that positive change. Um, so, you know, no matter what changes you've had neurologically, those changes are reversible providing you keep at it and keep making those changes because, you know, being reversible, it gives us potential to change negative issues, but it also means that any change is reverse if we don't keep at it. Um, one of the issues, you know, to explain your situation is that after the fit, your brain would naturally would have been on high alert for threat or after the meningitis, actually. So you would have been on high alert for threats, so your anxiety levels, your stress levels would have gone up. Uh, so, and it would have been looking for threat everywhere and predicting, trying to predict threat to try, uh, because the brain is there to try and protect us, to try and save us, um, to ensure that we survive. So the, the crochet would have, would have helped to calm that all down, would have helped to calm the system down. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little emotional hearing you talk because, um, I haven't talked about it in a long time, and um, it, it's such a, it was so traumatic. All those years were so yeah. traumatic for me because it was like, I, can't, I felt like I couldn't change. You know, I, I was like, 
how could I reverse meningitis? I mean, you can't. You just you get it, and then you yeah. get the seizure, and it and it was just it, it was so scary for me, and it was scary for my little children at the time. They were like five and two. And so yeah. to have to say to your babies, because I live in an urban lifestyle, I live in New York City, to have to say to them, okay, if mommy falls down, this is what we do. You know, you take my backpack, you put it under my head, and you yell for help. And, like, to have to tell that to a little child. Yeah, it was, very it was, scary. It was so scary for me. Um, but hearing you talk about how – oh, and the other thing I learned from my research after this was brain surgeons even – they're just kind of guessing when they go in there and poke around in your brain. Like there is not a lot we know, even though we know so much, there's not a lot we know about the brain because it's this. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you can never tell what a person's thinking, no yeah. matter what kind of tests or brain scans you give them. You can never really know without knowing. Also, you need to know, not only know what they're thinking at the moment, but what their background has been, what their experience has been, have been as a child. Um, what you know, uh, their social, the social context of their life is everything. Because every decision your brain makes, it makes by gathering all the information on, uh, from your past experiences. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, it's so complex. Um, <clears throat> I love how you said everything in the brain is reversible, and maybe it just wasn't on my radar. I was in my late twenties, so maybe I just wasn't well read or well listened at the time, but I, I heard this radio interview with Danny Glover who has apparently has epilepsy and he was talking about how, so a lot of times when people have seizures, they have an aura ahead of their seizure, yes. which tells them they're going to have one, which I've never experienced that before. <clears throat> and I've only had one seizure that I don't remember because I had a concussion. So I don't remember any of that. Um, but he was saying when I feel the aura, I, I tell my brain that you don't have to do that. Like he would think his way out of a seizure. And he had developed this little think system for himself that changed his life. And wow. when I heard him talk about it in such a sort of layman's way, I, that's when I was determined to, to heal. That, that changed me. I'm like, I'm, I'm not doing this. Yeah. I'm not going down this path. So thank you for talking about that. Okay. So <clears throat> just want to touch on some points of the book. Um, we were talking about the power to change thoughts. So you write that thoughts are not tangible events. And, and it's so interesting how our thoughts can just wreck us, you know, even yeah. though it's not an event. And so how does knitting help? And how does a, how does a project change the mindset? Well, what we found is that it changes, it focuses your mind on, some, on, on something more positive, focuses your mind on um, planning future things. So lot, lots of people, it, you know, sort of anxiety comes from either sort of thinking about the past or thinking about the future. And this is where, you know, the benefits of being in the moment yeah. um, come from. So um, in terms of the knitting, what we found is that it's, it tends to stop those ruminative thoughts. You know, when you, you think one dreadful thing and then another thought piles in on top of it or what is that, and then another thing piles on top of that, and before long you're going round in this cycle. Mm -hmm. And those thought, kinds of thoughts are very, very difficult to break because they happen in your subconscious. Uh, and no drugs can break into those at all, but knitting uh, seems to break into those ruminative thoughts and turns them around, people start looking forward to the next project. I can remember having, one of the first letters I ever uh, read was from a lady who tried to commit suicide. And um, her husband had taken her in some knitting into the hospital as a desperate attempt to try and get her interested in anything. And she said, now I look forward to my next project, I look forward to the next day, I look forward to tomorrow. And it had turned around her thinking because you soon get hooked on it. Uh, so you, you know, you you when you see um, a basket, somebody once described a basket of yarn as a basket of potential to me. When a knitter sees a basket of yarn, they're immediately thinking, "What am I going to do with that? What can I do with that? What projects can I do?" So it's it's focusing the mind on more forward, positive thinking um, part, uh, thoughts. So what that does then is strengthen those neural pathways, those more positive neural pathways. And when you're strengthening positive neural pathways, it's to the detriment of those pathways that, that you've got into the habits, you know, those negative 
um, back, backward thinking pathways. You use the word power a lot. So how does therapeutic knitting put power in your hands? And I, and I understand the question, the answer. I mean, actually, I feel like I know the answer to many of these questions, but people who are watching might not get it. So talk it's about portability. It. It's portability is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's used as healthcare tool. Um, you know, I have letters that say I don't now feel afraid of being unwell or uh, because I have a tool that I know that can help me through it. Or, um, for example, we've cured anxiety and panic attacks. We get people to carry around uh, um, a small kit in their bags that they keep in their bags at all time. And if they feel anxiety levels rising, they take their, their knitting out and the anxiety or panic attack stops instantaneously. Mm -hmm. They then say, well, actually, I found I don't have to take it out, just the knowledge that it's there. So it gives you, it's the portability of knitting really that gives you that, it, it is very powerful in your hands because it, it helps you to achieve instantaneous calm. So talk about, you write in the book, wellness equals flexibility. So that, I don't think I would have chosen flexibility, but now I, now I will. It's amazing, what, why does wellness equal flexibility? Um, well, when when you get highly stressed or even just overly busy, uh, or certainly when you get ill, your your sort of experience space tends to narrow down, and you focus more and more on on problems. And the more problems you get, the more you focus down on the problems, to the detriment of the sort of wider picture of the world. And and you tend to focus more and more on the negative things, and then you you start not to notice the positive or good things that are happening around you, that are happening in your life, that are happening in the world. And, uh, and to be well, you need that wider perspective. You need that wider experience base, really. When you've got a wider experience base, your brain comes to different decisions because it's got a wider experience base to to draw on uh, when it's making its its decisions. So living, having a creative life can help us to expand our, our uh, experience base. I have daughters who are teenager, uh, teenagers and tweenagers, and I often use this question. I'll say, will you be thinking about this on your wedding day? You know, like <laughs> I just choose this, you know, fantasy day in their future. Like, will this be important on that day? To, to, for the same reason, like, let's not focus on that right now. Let's, like, let's go wider, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, so so I'm really fascinated by Maslow's hierarchy pyramid, and I I live in a city where there's very rich and very poor people um, in every step I take, and yeah. so I'm often I sort of thinking think about this all the time because I I want to know how can I help you know do I give money to someone on the train or is my help better served somewhere else. And I'm always thinking about, you know, sort of, and when I, like, for example, when I was medicated uh, for my brain disorder, I just felt like absence of creativity. I felt like I was just survival mode the whole That's time. That's right. Yes, you go into survival mode, don't you? You lose that wider perspective. It's mm -hmm. a real narrow tunnel of, of surviving. Yeah, so just talk about that a little bit because I think sometimes people get stuck in surviving and they need to elevate yeah. how do we get to the place where knitting can actually you know maybe even lift us out of survival mode yeah that's that's a, a really difficult one to answer isn't it I think because it sort of depends on so many things going on in your life but I think I think you can I think by doing it to appreciate being in the moment and taking one moment at a time and not sort of, because if you try, and when you're in that kind of situation, if you try and think about the bigger picture, it's just too much to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so it can it can actually train you to focus on enjoying each moment. Uh, and what we've also found that um, it can be easy to forget the feeling of relaxation if you're sort of very busy or very stressed. So we, we've also used it to, to help people to, to, well, to actually retrain them into what it actually feels like to be relaxed. So if you get somebody knitting, you can actually say to them, uh, try and remember what this feels like, and then they can remember what it feels like even when they don't have their knitting to hand. 
And we've also used a uh, visualization of knitting as well. So if you haven't got your knitting needles and yarn with you, if you visualize yourself knitting, it has a very similar effect. But we know that visualizing a movement actually works the brain in a very similar way to, mo to actually moving. I was going to talk about that a little bit later, but I love that you brought that up because there's two things in my life right now. One, I have someone in my life who um, I feel needs a reminder of the relaxed state, you know, because this person is so sort of wound up and 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 everything is sort of in line in a like everything is in a good place in this person's life, but she's now you know it's a she. She's um. She's still. She can't remember how to feel relaxed. So I want to. I want to yeah. say, okay, now that everything's in place, let's go back to the we're good place. You know, because yeah. I think it's the neural pathways that have just been retrained because it was a high stress yes. environment for a while. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know our society measures success by how busy we are, by busyness, and people have, uh, feel they have to be busy to justify themselves. And I found, I found myself saying it, you know, when people ask me how I am, I say, well, I'm busy, I'm really busy, <laughs> as if it's, you know, such a good thing to, yeah. be, to, be, to be really busy, to justify my existence. Yeah. Um, but I, I, we've got used to doing that, and I think knitting is a, a really, really good tool, and knitting and crochet are really good tools for enabling people to switch off on a daily basis, but at the same time as switching off you're actually being productive mm -hmm. so it satisfies the sort of two needs of, of need, wanting to be productive but also sort of taking time out for yourself and it's really really important we you know we're having more and more problems with young people with mental health um, issues certainly here in the UK so I would imagine in, in you know where you are as well and that's because they never switch off mm -hmm. I, I keep telling this person let's get off the phone Let's get off the YouTube. Let's, you know, just be. Let's process the day, you know? Yeah, yeah. You choose. You can choose. It doesn't have to be knitting. Choose whatever you want. Just choose it and yes. process the day. So I totally agree with you. Um, and then the other thing about uh, the, oh, well, I, one thing about my seizure, I was very grateful that it was that, it was that because it literally, I had to stop. Like, it was such a physical <laughs> manifestation that... I, I, it was easier to say no because of the nature of my crisis, but so yes. many of us are having a crisis that isn't as dramatic, so it's, yes. it's hard to say no. And then the visualization, a lot of times when I'm, I don't really have trouble sleeping and I, and I don't have a hard time falling asleep at night, I, it's, I wouldn't say that I have a problem, but on the off, you know, on those days when I'm like having a hard time winding down, I totally knit in my brain, I knit in my head. <laughs> I visualize yeah. it. Yeah, it stops those thoughts whirling around immediately. Yeah. Really good really good tool to use just you know, just before bed yeah. or even in the middle of the night. Uh-huh. Back to the throw. I love it. Or before it. you know, before interviews, before an exam, calm your mind. Yeah. I think it was um I interviewed I think it was Ben. He said that he was it Ben? Someone um, when I was doing Manch I was interviewing men who knit and I think someone was bringing it like before a test. I feel like that yeah. rings a bell. Remind me who you are when you watch this. Okay, so I really want to talk about addiction now and sort of the feel-good chemicals of the brain as a reward system. And I want to ask you, can you become addicted to knitting? Uh, yes, I think you can. And so I, I would call it, and that's actually where the therapeutic side of it comes in as well because you need to know your limits as well of, of how, you know, it's not all, it's not about sitting all day knitting. Um, it's about actually getting your life in balance. It's about using it as, as a tool, using it healthily. It's not good to sit all day. So, you know, sort of recognizing that you need alongside that to get up and move, uh, to have a healthy diet. So that, you know, therapy, when we're teaching people to use it as a tool, we use it in that wider picture so we very much say to people after 20 minutes get up and walk around have a stretch focus your eyes on uh, on, a, on a distant object um, and if you get carried away set yourself a, a gentle alarm that'll uh, um, you know that'll remind you to get up 
and do that. So, the, you know, that's very much part of that therapeutic aspect of it. And then how can knitting replace an addiction? Well, um, I've, uh, I have a friend who, uh, or a colleague who's used it with people with uh, drug addiction. And um, what he found was that it's the first time he's been able to get uh, um, people who are addicts around in a group sitting and talking about their problems. Wow. Um, and that's that was very unusual to actually get them calm enough to sit. But what what it seems to do it it because it occupies the mind and the hands, so it helps people to stop smoking. It helps people to stop overeating, to stop snacking. So it occupies your mind and your hands, but it also replaces those chemicals because the the three reasons why uh, addicts normally fail to stop is um, the fact that they, you know they want something to do with their hands. Uh, they have the craving for the for the chemical, but also when you stop an addiction, you're left with an enormous amount of spare time. Um, so, the the sort of usual course of events would be that they probably get really bored, and when they get really bored, they then succumb to the addiction again. Um, and you also find uh, support, you know, the social support that you need to help you through as well through through belonging to the knitting community. So as soon as you start knitting, you really belong to a knitting community, a wider world knitting community, really. Um, so it can help, you know, it, with all aspects like that. Many, many people are very successful giving up smoking with knitting. Mm -hmm. Do you, I will say my mom and I have figured out that peanut M&Ms are very easy to eat while knitting. So <laughs> we need to work on that. <laughs> Are you aware of uh, rehab programs that incorporate knitting, like as part of their program? Um, there are a few small um, programs, like there are um, some um, women's hostels that use it for for abused women. Um, very small at the moment, but um, I'm hoping as the medical profession starts to accept this and they're you know they are beginning to come around to this now yeah, after 10 years of long hard work they're beginning to come around um, and I get more and more emails from clinicians who are saying I really would like to use knitting in my um, in, you know in my treatment plans mm -hmm. so um, yeah that you know it would be really nice to see that um, alongside medical treatments because it's become really obvious that you can't just treat medical symptoms on their own. You have to, to be successful in the longer term, you have to look at that person's wider life, the, big, the bigger picture of their life, and to deal with those issues as well. Yeah. What is your take on medicine? I mean, is there, because for me, I, I noticed that people would ask me about my knitting crochet, and I, and I would say off the cuff, oh, I'm doing this instead of taking Prozac. Like, I would kind of, it's kind of yeah. a joke. But it was totally true. Yeah. So talk about, you know, can someone get off their meds with knitting? Yes. Um, and I have helped people to do that. But what I would say is that medication is really important if it's used properly with a specific aim in mind. The problem with long-term conditions is that medication... For a lot of long-term conditions, medication is not that helpful because your body uh, gradually gets to tolerate the levels. So you have to push, you know, you have to push the levels up. I'm thinking, I'm thinking here particularly of antidepressants, and um, um, I mean, you, you and we have a massive problem with morphine addiction, uh, oxytocin addiction, yes. um, and um, we know now that that isn't beneficial for long-term pain. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you can use knitting um, in, in, as a tool to deal with symptoms um, of medical problems, but what I would say is that medication is really good in the shorter term to enable you to move, to enable you to get these plans in place. Mm -hmm. um, kind of back, like what we were talking about before, get back to that relaxed place. Yeah. Get the help you need to like propel out of it again. Yes. 
-hmm. but the but the but the essential thing is is that you build your ladder out of the pit really um when, when you're in the pit you need you need to have prepared your ladder out of it first really and learned the skills and knitting is is a really good skill that you could use and it and again the portability of it comes in here big time because it enables clinic it will enable clinicians to help people even in bed, even you know, even in intensive care, if they're able to knit, mm -hmm. so you can prevent people going into these um, cycles of depression right be before they before they start. Uh, you could help people to socialise, so to stop prevent them from getting lonely. Loneliness is one of the biggest causes of, you know, loneliness and stress. One of the biggest causes of ill health. Um, so you can, uh, knitting enables socialization because it helps people to deal with, um, it gives them a self-soothing tool really to deal with any emotional uh, anxiety they may have at going out um, into social, uh, in the social context. Right. So, you know, you can use it in, many, in lots of different ways. What about, um, something that I had never thought about before was throwing versus continental. And oh yeah, that's a tricky. That's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah, crossing the midline. So, talk about talk about that. Like, do you really? I mean, obviously, you wrote it in the book. Does it make a difference if you throw or not? If we're getting down to the nitty gritty of the movements, then it probably does make a difference. But I wouldn't change anybody's no no, no. way of knitting. So um, what we know is that if you do a bilateral pattern, coordinated pattern of movements, you're working both sides of the brain very hard and you're integrating the sort of the, the information from both sides. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you go across the midline of the body, you're making your brain work even harder because it's really confusing. Um, so it makes sense then, and, and if then if you add a, a really complex pattern to it, you're really taking up a lot of brain capacity in that moment, so you have less capacity left to pay attention to any other issues. Um, so whether that difference, how how big that difference is, I, do, I don't know, but that's the sort of, that's the theory behind it. The more you can move across the midline, uh, the more a brain capacity you're taking up. So if you have a big event some night, maybe don't do your lace work all afternoon. You might be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with but you can also you can also choose your projects according to the mindset that you want to go into. Yeah, we can skip to that because I really wanted to talk about that. So because you had this list, I actually wrote it down. Um, where did I write it? Intricate. Oh. I'm sure. You, oh, intricate novelty, automatic, group, big, quick fix, bag, and free knitting. Yes. So talk about. Yes. You can talk about some of your favorites, or just talk about the theory behind it. Well, I would advocate having lots of different projects going on at the same time, which most knitters uh, like the idea of, mm -hmm. and then choosing what you're going to knit on that day, either according to the, your mood of that day or according to what mood you'd like to go into. So, for example, if you want to go into a sort of a focused attention mood that maybe you've got something bothering you that you just want to have, give your mind a break from, uh, then you could choose an integrate project, maybe like, um, you know, a lace project that where you have to, ca or, or a project where you have to count and really focus on it. Um, we know that learning new skills uh, grows new brain cells and new neural pathways. So if you want to grow a healthy brain, Always have a new project on the go, learn, learn a new skill on a regular basis. Uh, in terms of the easy projects, I mean, I've had a, um, a garter knit wide shawl going on for the last couple of months because my husband's just had major heart surgery. And that's the only thing I could focus on. But the, what that did then, I didn't have to think about it. It was purely automatic, but it got my hands into this nice rhythmic, calming movement without my having to think at all. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we get it, we're in a situation in life where we where we can't think straight. So it's good to have a really easy project um, like that. A bad project I, I would have uh, carry around with me, if particularly if you have um, uh, you know you know if you're prone to feeling anxious in in social places or on public transport. Lots of knitters use knitting on public transport because 
I find it uncomfortable, they find it unpleasant. Um, and in that respect, the hand position of knitting or crochet actually uh, provides a buffer to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So you're actually securing your personal space. So you create this bubble of calm around yourself where you're, where you're securing your personal space and nobody can intrude on that. So that works really well there. So, um, and I've also found it really useful to have a, what I call a big project on the go where I may be doing a big throw or a big shawl that's something that's steady in the background, that's going on, that's my constant friend in the background. Um, when, my, when my mother died five years ago, my, one of my good friend's husband died in the same week, and we sat and we knitted a comfort blanket each, a, a really big project, and we just sat and knitted together, and we didn't have to talk at mm -hmm. all. And members of our knitting group just knocked on the door, brought their knitting, sat down and sat. And nobody, we didn't need to talk. It was just uh, being there together, just, you know, just being. And I think we, we've lost that in the world. We've lost, it's so important to uh, have the experience of just being, enjoying just being with other people without feeling you need to contribute. Uh, so that's why I chose that range of projects. I love it because some people are monogamous knitters, but others, you know, you can lift up any nook or cranny and find something, and you've <laughs> just given us permission to keep being crazy like that. So Absolutely, thank yeah. You. I yeah. was thinking about what you said um, about, and since I'm a mother, and I, you obviously are a mother too, um, watching the progression of technology, right? Even from, my daughter's 15, so even from when she was a baby to now, my youngest and oldest are 10 years apart, and they're they're experiencing a com almost a completely different, you know, yeah. digital upbringing in only 10 years. And so, you know, they're not unplugging as much as I want them to. And, and I just had this thought while, we, while you were talking about back in the day, women were knitting, women and men were knitting because we needed socks we needed sweaters, we needed these things, you know, now we can just buy them at Target for $10, you know, we, we can get, it's so accessible. So even knitting, the purpose has changed because I'm thinking how many projects I knit, and I will wear them, but I'm definitely not knitting them because I need, to, need them to wear. It's mm -hmm. almost like the process is more important than the end product. Yeah, I would definitely say the, pro uh, the process is more important than the end product. Although the end product is important as well because, you know, it enables you to give gifts and there's lots of research around the benefits of giving gifts, uh, you know, and the reward of the end product. But the, the process and getting your mind into the rhythm of movements, that is more important than the end, than the end product. And in terms of the technology... I mean, I'm lucky that my, my children are all in their late 20s. So um, we didn't have that that sort of full-on 24-hour-7 social media. Mm -hmm. And there's a, we have got a huge problem, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the making with young children now. Um, but the youngest person I worked with, uh, who had long-term pain was a 12-year-old, um, and you know you sit, you sit and you talk to them, and they get they don't take any time off at all. They they switched. They've got their phones by their bedsides on their beds 24/7. They can't go out with their friends without putting makeup on or looking good because if somebody will take a photograph and it's on Facebook or on YouTube or somewhere, and somebody's making fun of it, mm -hmm. so they they just cannot relax at all um, and so they never switch off and that that's we're going to have huge problems with mental health issues we're already seeing it yeah yeah definitely uh, okay so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, sorry can I have a few more minutes of your time do you have to go Push yes. yeah that's fine yes uh, what about quiet knitting you, you call it quiet knitting in the book like We've talked a lot about the social aspect, but what what is quiet knitting, and how can we, you know, make use of that? Well, the, the benefits of knitting on your own are different from knitting in a group, and then when you're knitting on your own, you can choose to have 
some really quiet knitting where you, when you're in a room, you know, on your own, just just focusing on you and focusing on how you feel, focusing on the moment. Or you can choose to knit, you know, in front of a film. You can choose to knit with your family uh, uh, on your own in that in that respect. So I think it's really important to have some quiet time to yourself every day. Again, it's part of this switching off. Uh, gather, you know, to gather your thoughts. I think that's that's important. It need only be, you know, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips on making knitting a habit? Um, I was I set aside ten minutes a day, even if I'm busy, to knit. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, our research showed that. The more frequently people knit, the happier and calmer they feel. And they needed to knit more than three times uh, a week for that to kick in. And actually, we found that 81% of respondents to our survey felt happier after knitting, and 54% of those felt very happy, and only 1% stayed sad. Mm. And that translated across to people with clinical depression. So... Um, so I would set aside a minimum of 10 minutes, so 10 to 20 minutes if you can every day. Uh, and that will help, what that will help you do is manage your stress, your daily stress levels. Mm -hmm. And you may not be aware of stress even, but you know, our modern day stress is insidious. It builds up in the background without us noticing it. Uh, so it's really important to set that time, small amount of time aside every day um, for your own health and that stops problems then building up and stacking up. You said in the book that time will appear to pass differently. What do you mean by that? Yes, you can You can actually, if you get into the flow of movement, you don't notice time passing. So we can use it in different ways. You can actually make time appear to go slower by getting absorbed in an activity. I don't know if you felt that when, you, when, when you're knitting, but also we can use it, for example, you know, you mentioned before using knitting to cut down on medication. If you're cutting down on medication, you can use knitting as a tool in the half hour or the hour or so before medication is due to kick in. Right. And actually help that um, time to pass without sort of the craving. You could also use it, um, lots of people use it when they're in waiting rooms, people with, uh, yeah. people who have cancer in particular mm -hmm. use it because that entails, the whole condition entails a lot of waiting around in waiting rooms, waiting for test results mm -hmm. with this roller coaster of emotions. So it becomes a particularly powerful tool then. So you can use it to manage time and how fast you you how fast or quickly you perceive that it's passing mm -hmm. good uh, talk about the posture why is it important um it's important really because you don't want to put any a strain on a on a particular joint so if you're if you're if it's like sort of sitting at, at a computer mm -hmm. you know if you're sitting for longish periods of the day it makes sense to sit to sit well with a, mm -hmm. with a good posture otherwise you're, you may be causing yourself some some problems later down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's 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 nothing major. It's just something to be aware of, really, while you, while you knit. But what we have found is that um, we have adapted certain postures for people with hand problems and neck problems uh, because it's really sad to see, particularly older older women who have loved knitting in the past. Uh, actually not knitting anymore because they think it's it's damaging their hands and, that, and it's going to give them arthritis where actually the the reverse is true it actually they need to move you need to move human beings are made to move and movement lubricates your joints mm -hmm. um, so you need to move but you need to move in an informed way so we've we've adapted a posture so I would advocate using circular needles for people who've got hand problems circular polished birch needles sort of they're wooden but they're they're slippery so they haven't got that friction on the hands and with with circular needles you don't have the weight of the project in your hands you've got it in your lap mm -hmm. if, yeah so if you've got neck problems I will put a, a, a bed pillow across your lap so you've got the weight of your arms on the pillow so you're not holding the weight of your arms 
um, and also um, if you've got a copy holder you can hold the pattern upright so you're not looking down yes. so you want to avoid looking down if you've got neck problems avoid looking down so we've actually enabled anybody coming to our group to knit even if they've got rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia quite severely affecting their hands and actually it's improved their hand function significantly and the circular needle needles are good for the train because sometimes your needles stick out too yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry yes. um, and look for as well because you can take them on a plane yeah yes uh, I love how you talked about uh, color you know if you're depressed choose something bright if you're manic choose something subdued I love that you've added color therapy into the therapeutic knitting. And I, you also talked about rhythm and how rocking chair is like the ultimate enhancement to your knitting. So sort of adding color and texture and the rhythm or kind of enhancing it. Yes. Yeah, and our, actually re, our research surprisingly found that texture was twice as significant as color for affecting mood. Interesting. Um, and if you try it out, actually, if you if you get a yarn in your favorite color, but it feels horrible, it feels nylony, or, or you know how some some of them feel almost static, don't they? Um, you will recoil from it. Mm -hmm. um, so the that texture is more important. So you need to think about that when when you're knitting as well. So you know if you if your mood is a bit low, choose your favorite color to knit and choose a color that's beautiful, uh, a texture that's beautiful as well. Um, yeah, so you know that's all. In, that's all. Sort of the the whole experience is important. Even the texture and color of your needles. Yeah, I just wanted to end up with a few um, thoughts about the special knitting project. So you mentioned that your husband just went through heart surgery. Did you pick out a special knitting project for yourself? I did. Yes, I've been doing. I've been doing this garter knit shawl, and yeah, it's, it's in a beautiful, luxurious sort of cashmere mix. And a, a range of color of of greens. Uh, so the color's fabulous. The texture's fabulous. It's getting long enough now that I can wrap myself in it as I'm doing it. Um, and it was just something I needed something at that stage that I didn't have to think about. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea because I've actually had surgery a couple of times, or um, you know, sort of. Well, I've had unexpected injuries like broke my foot, which is like, oh, mother of three, city life, what, you know, so totally unexpected, I couldn't plan for it, but then I had like a cyst removed from my foot, so I knew I was going to be out of commission for a week or two, and there's a lot of surgery like that in our lives too, yeah. and so I yeah. just love how you talked about, you know, put it, you didn't say this exactly, but put it on the calendar and then prepare, you know, think about what you want to do, what would bring you joy, so that you can just focus on that and not the fact that you're totally out of whack with your life yeah yeah you 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 sort of plan you pl there there are there are things you can plan for in your life and plan your knitting around you know what kind of project would actually be most beneficial for you at that time mm -hmm. again that's part of the sort of therapeutic knitting side of it it's not just picking up any knitting project it's choosing that project specifically for what you want to achieve at I just wanted to um I was going to maybe talk about the brain medicine cabinet because I love this idea of, of sort of storing tools in our toolbox. Um, yeah. For total... I've got, total... I've got my Wi-Fi back now, so... Oh, it's back. Yeah. So do you, do you want to talk about the brain medicine cabinet? Uh, yeah, well, your brain makes, uh, your brain makes its own uh, drugs. Uh, and the activities that make us feel safe, that we enjoy, and safe social contact enable you to access that your own drugs and they're far more powerful than anything your doctor can prescribe for you with no side effects whereas you know stress uh, and conditions that make you feel fearful uh, close off loneliness close off your access to those to those drugs so the more we can engage in the kind of activity that makes us feel safe that we enjoy that's calming uh, the better it is for us and we can learn you know we can learn to use that to our advantage where, well, first of all, did you knit all of these items I see on you and in, and behind you? I did. They're beautiful. <laughs> I can tell you like certain colors. Um, uh, yes, how did you guess? <laughs> the blues, Actually, the greens. Yeah, you've got some pink behind you. I yes, I'm a pink girl. I'm a pink girl. Yeah. Um, do you, so talk about Stitch Link so that people who are watching today know, because it, it doesn't end with this interview, it doesn't end with the book. 
So talk about Stitch Links so we know. Yeah. Well, I set up Stitch Links in 2005 because um, I recognized that actually this could be really important, but I also recognized that the media could actually um, could actually put false headlines out there. And actually, when we when we published our first paper, there was a headline in one of the one of the big UK papers saying knitting cures depression. We thought, well, I I recognized that we needed some uh, a, a, a center of information that could always be relied on to give accurate information and be accurate and um, not, you know was because we could be dealing with very vulnerable people as well and they always needed accurate information so I, I set up stitch links and it's got three arms it's got the um, friendship sort of network we have a Facebook page um, and we have a secret Facebook group uh, and then it's a sort of resource for anybody wanting to use therapeutic knitting but also for professionals wanting to use therapeutic knitting with their clients so clinicians teachers um, so basically an area really that people could go to for more information on therapeutic knitting there's a lot of there's a, got, a, got quite a few health articles up there as well on the health page is this your only book um, well, I have written the text for a book called Crochet Therapy, um, and there is another book coming out next week where I've written the foreword. So I've, I've worked with a British designer, and it's called Knit Yourself Calm. So it's about managing stress um, with knitting. But I'm writing another one on well-being at the moment. So um, I think that will be a self-published one again. <laughs> Because my that knit, knit for health and wellness, I self-published that. It is self-published. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Beth and Corkel, I'm so glad you said yes. It's really good to meet you. And if I, I can some... help to anybody who's listening or watching this, then please feel feel free to email me anybody with any questions. Thank you. And I just love reading the book. So many people have loved it. It's touched so many lives, and I. I will always, always be telling people that knitting and crocheting made me well again. So thanks for calling attention to it. That's and, good. And thank you for spending an hour and five minutes with me today. That's Don't great. Don't love technology? Technology is good for something, right? Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. so far away from each other. So thank you so much. Yeah. Have yeah. a great day. Good to meet you. Bye. Bye.